Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, amazing hospitality in Doha. Everybody's been very nice. And uh, I was tweeting at how insecure the amount of breakfast at this conference makes me feel. Um, because <laughs> I run a, a conference in the US and I go to lots of events and this is like the biggest conference breakfast I've ever seen. Four omelet stations and uh, enough croissants to uh, fatten the entire country of Qatar. So um, I had a few, so I apologize for looking a little chubby. But uh, today's topic is gamification. And you know, I'm sure many of you have heard about it or have an opinion about it. And uh, I want to talk to you about how it applies to mobile and how you know, it substantially changes uh, all of our lives. In order to put it into context, though, we have to ask ourselves, you know, we have to need to talk about a context in which gamification is useful. And one of the core concepts that you know, we think about that affects all of us is this notion that change is hard. Change is a hard thing to accomplish. And I, I put up an image of US President Barack Obama for a particular reason. As many of you know, his platform uh, for election was based on a concept of change. And of course, you can just ask him how hard it is uh, to change a large system like the United States after uh, four years have elapsed. And of course, change is very, very hard to accomplish. And we heard many panelists talk about you know, needing to support feature phones in a world where that seems uh, increasingly crazy. But is change really that hard? Isn't this weird? Here's a graph of social media adoption in the world. So in 2005, nobody tweeted or posted status updates or took pictures of their food or their like cats or wrote like a blog about it and like made little collages of everything that was on their mind at any time or shared their music online. 2005. And in six short years, over 60% of people in the West do it. Wow, 60%. Have we ever seen a behavior change like that in the history of humanity? Can we point to any examples where a behavior goes from no action to 30 to 40 times a day per person in six years since the beginning? I don't think so. So is change really hard or is change really easy? It's hard to tell. In fact, it points out an important uh, dichotomy, which is that change is happening on two parallel tracks at all times. Changing people's behavior collectively can happen exponentially, as in the social media example that I just gave you. Change from you know, 10,000 meters is exponential, but on an individual basis, change is linear. That is to say, each one of us changes our behavior like it's the first day of our lives every single time. If I want to lose five kilos this year and you manage to lose 20 kilos this year, I don't get to come to you and borrow five of your kilos and lose them like that. My weight loss process is independent of yours no matter how supportive you are. I start from the beginning, I do it myself every time. And so, while we get very excited about these big changes like mobile commerce, like games, like social media, we must recognize that each and every one of us comes to this process of change alone and individually. And so there are three key recurring themes about every single thing that's ever changed human behavior in a substantial way, in a substantial, lasting, and durable way. These three things keep coming up over and over again. And they're really simple. It's disarmingly simple, but they're always there. And they are feedback, friends, and fun. It turns out if an activity has feedback, friends, and fun baked into it, people love it. Surprise. Feedback, friends, and fun. Now, many of you may already be thinking to yourself, huh, I know some things that have feedback, friends, and fun in them, right? And you know I'm getting up here, I'm talking about games, so obviously uh, that's going to be one of the core ideas. But this notion of gamification has really taken off in the context of this idea that we want to change behavior, that we want to engage people. And one of my favorite examples of how powerful the notion of feedback, friends, and fun can be is embodied in a core question about what is fun. So let me describe a game to you, okay? I'm gonna describe an experience. Um, 
you're given a small plot of land. It's not necessarily fertile. You have to till this land and get some seeds and plant them. And then hopefully the rain will come or you have to water the, plant, the grass. And then when uh, your plants grow, your crops grow, you harvest those crops and you take them to a market in town where they give you some money for them and then you do that again. And hopefully try to get some of your friends to come and start a farm with you. Does that sound like fun? Does that sound like a fun game? Everyone, you want to drop what we're doing right now and go out into the fields and farm? Right? Sounds so cool. Of course, I'm describing Farmville. That's the world's most popular game, the most popular game of all time, measured by number of people playing or by amount of time or by dollar spent per user. Far and away, the most popular game of all time is based on a medieval <laughs> ritual of farming, which all of us, our forefathers, gave up so that we could be here in this lovely hotel in Doha today to talk about mobile and gamification. Why does so many people want to play this game? It doesn't make any sense. And it's because it's not the theme of something that makes it fun, right? It's the mechanics of something that make it fun. The theme is a lure. It's like what's in the window, the clothes or the thing in the window. But it's the mechanics that get somebody to stay and keep staying and get engaged and keep engaging, interact with other people. Now, it turns out that there's a big reason why games and gamified concepts are so powerful. Human beings are wired to enjoy the challenges of gaming. Every time you challenge yourself in your, in your mind to any task in the world, any kind of challenge whatsoever, and then you achieve the challenge, so challenge, achievement, your brain produces a small amount of a magical little chemical called dopamine. Any kind of challenge, any kind of achievement, dopamine. And the dopamine release in your brain makes your whole entire body go, ah, that's fantastic, right? And then a second later, your brain says, I would like to do that again because that was really good, that was pleasurable, that was enjoyable, I'd like to do that again. This applies to all kinds of experiences in our lives, whether that's trying to run a marathon, or jump over something, or learn a new task, or play a video game. We are wired as people to continuously challenge ourselves and then to try to exceed those challenges each and every time. It's no wonder in that context that games are so powerful at changing behavior. It turns out they also affect our brains. In research in Germany on the effect of learning to play a game, in this case, the research was about learning to juggle. Researchers gave a group of people a juggling challenge, 12 weeks, and they gave them MRIs, so scans of their brain throughout the 12 weeks, and they learned to juggle. And in 12 weeks, they noted a marked change in gray matter in the brain just from the activity of learning to play, learning to juggle. And they redid the research five years later, 2004, 2008. They redid the research about five years later to find out that it doesn't matter how good you are at playing the game, it's simply the act of trying it that changes your brain. Just attempting changes your brain. So it's no wonder that we love games so much. There's this concept that reinforces it called fluid intelligence. And some of you uh, may be familiar with this notion, but basically um, we have two kinds of intelligence at any one time. We have what's called crystalline intelligence, which is basically knowing the things we already know uh, and being able to recall them and work with them. And we have this concept called fluid intelligence, which is our ability to problem solve in real time and come up with cool new ideas. This kind of intelligence has frequently been the one cited as the important future uh, construct for people. And in lecturing at Harvard on how to increase the fluid intelligence of people, Andrea Kusevsky identified five core things that people can do to become more intelligent. And she said, the research suggests that if you seek novelty, you challenge yourself, you think creatively, you do things the hard way, and you network, you will increase your intelligence. Wow. Do these five things resemble the, any activity that you may have recently done? 
These are some of the core design concepts of games. In fact, most of the games that we play have those, that we're really attracted to have those elements in them. Thinking creatively, doing things the hard way, right? Games are not about think, doing things the easy way, they're about doing things the hard way. Imagine if the game of Pac-Man was just you came in and you went a straight line down the middle, ate up all the coins, bing, congrats, and you did that again and over and over again. Would that be fun? If I took out all the challenges? It wouldn't be. It also turns out that there's a profound shift happening as a result of games in the world. And it's happening to our children in a really dramatic way. You know, I am uh, 37 years old, so I was among the first generation of people who had uh, games in the home. The Atari 2600 was the first game console that I played with. And uh, in my age, the only thing I had to be able to do to play a game was do this, right? Move a joystick and press a button. That's all I had to do to play. Today's kids, wow. They don't just do this anymore. They have to do five, six, seven things simultaneously to be able to play a game like World of Warcraft. They have to be able to operate their character, chat with other people in text and voice, deal with short and long-term challenges, and with the constant interruption of their parents. This makes today's children extraordinarily different from people my age. They are from the very youngest, from the very, very beginning of their childhood trained to multitask at a level that no human has ever had to before, principally because of games. And this has a very specific impact on our world, which you can take both positively and negatively, which is that the world that most of us inhabit seems painfully slow to our children. Painfully, painfully slow. Extraordinarily boring. Sitting through my lecture <laughs> would be inconceivable for our, most of our children, and they will likely never sit through a lecture like this in their lives because the world is changing. I'm cool with that, by the way. The other way that games have affected our minds, our brains, our culture, is the notion of economics. They have both introduced billions of people to some of the core concepts of economics in a way that no textbook and no real life experience ever has. If you think about the complexity of the economic system in most games, it rivals our, um, our national economic systems. But also, it changes people's perception of how economics work in an interesting way. In, um, in most games, in social games like Farmville, one of the main things that they're capable of doing is removing uh, an important barrier to customer satisfaction. I'll explain what I mean. So most places that want you to pay for something, like let's say an online subscription site to a newspaper, they say, okay, we have some free content for you, but when you want to subscribe, like the New York Times, which is a big newspaper in New York City where I live, like the New York Times says, okay, there's some free content, you can read three free articles a week, but if you want more than that, it's gonna be $4. It's gonna be $4 a week to access the newspaper. That's how it works. It's gonna be $4 a week, or you can have it for free. So here's how Farmville works, or most social games work. It's brilliant. So comes to a moment in the game and says, oh my gosh, you are awesome. You are so good at what you've done that your farm has just gotten bigger. Congratulations. Now you're gonna need a much bigger tractor to keep farming your farm. And that tractor costs 20,000 coins. Oh, you don't have 20,000 coins? Okay, no problem. Well, you can do one of two different things. You can keep farming and selling your stuff at the market and eventually you'll get 20,000 coins. And that's up to you, you can do that. Or, you know what, you're kind of busy. You're busy, you've got other things to do. Do you have $4? Give me $4, I'll give you 20,000 coins. It's no problem, you're busy. You've got kids, you've got a life, $4? Okay, so it sets up a very, very interesting choice model for consumers. You can either spend your time or your money. So consumers are naturally 
happier about that choice than they are for any other purchase option they're given in the rest of the world because they had a choice, because they could get the thing for free if they're just willing to spend their time, but nobody spends their time, so they give you money. And so lesson number one of social game economics is uh, give people the choice of time or so, you know, friends or money. And lesson number two, which is embodied in this interesting little stat, the 92% of people who play social games don't pay for them. So this whole industry is based on 8% of people paying and 92% of people never ever paying for anything. But that 8% has funded this entire humongous business. How is it possible? Until you know that top players of the game Farmville spend upwards of $10,000 a month playing the game, yes, how, how do you think Zynga gets to be like a $10 billion business? Um, they spend upwards of $10,000 a month playing this game that everybody else plays for free. What? That's crazy, right? Lesson number two of social games, never limit the upper amount of money somebody will pay you for a product or service. And this is part of the big excitement, part of the excitement and enthusiasm about gamification is challenging some of these core ideas. So it's no wonder when you put all of that into context that games have become so important and so powerful. They're changing our brains. They're changing our economies. Our younger gen youngest generation today are brought up on them. They see the world differently because of them. The world is changing. So this concept of gamification, let me give you a quick working definition. It's the process of using game thinking and game mechanics to engage users. The process of using game thinking and game mechanics to engage users. That means necessarily that it's not just throwing some badges on your website. For those of you who know many of the examples of gamification, the ones that people think of first are all about using badges to engage audiences. There's nothing wrong with badges. Badges are awesome, but they're not the be all end all. And the second thing that gamification is not, and this is incredibly, incredibly important, it is not about using game ideas where they do not belong. It's not about introducing game concepts where they're not appropriate. It's not about making everything in the world into a game. That is simplistic. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. We have to take the best ideas from games, mechanistic, thematic, all these different elements, and use them in the ways that are most appropriate for the situation, for the customer, for the context. We do not seek in gamification to make everything about shooting zombies. That doesn't work. And most of the examples of the stuff that failed in the past was that kind of thing. You know, your soup company wants to do gamification, so it's, you know, we fly through space and shoot soup out of the sky. We shoot the Kenora, you know, boo boo. And then we land on planet Alpha 17 and we build a space station out of delicious soup and then we buy the soup on the web store, right? That was the ridiculousness of old gamification. Now, we take the ideas and the concepts from games to build unprecedented engagement, that's what we do. So me, I'm the chairman of Gamification Summit, I've written two books about it, um, I help a whole bunch of companies, uh, big and small, apply gamification to their lives. Um, this is my next event, it's in San Francisco in June, it's pretty cool. Um, here are some of the companies that build uh, gamification technologies. Lots of um, the things I'm going to show you today were homegrown, but lots of the things that you might choose to do with gamification uh, can leverage existing technologies from various vendors to make it possible for you to do this much faster and at greater scale than was possible before, and I highly encourage you to find out more about it. Okay, I want to give you some examples so that we can contextualize gamification and you can start to think creatively about the ways that it will affect your business, whether you know, you're a mobile operator or thinking about mobile or whatever it is that you do. So are you guys all familiar with speed cameras? They take your, they're awful, right? Everywhere in the world they have these speed cameras. They take your picture, you're going too fast, they send you a ticket in the mail. So in Scandinavia, the ticket that you receive is based not on how fast you're going, but on how much money you make per year. So the wealthier you are, the bigger the ticket you get for speeding. So it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff, actually. Sweden last year gave out a $250,000 ticket to somebody for speeding, which is kind of amazing, right? Okay. So as part of a contest, as part of an interesting design contest, 
a guy named Kevin Richardson reimagined the speeding camera. So instead of when you drive by a speeding camera and you're going too fast, it takes a picture of your license plate and sends you a ticket in the mail. The way that speed camera lottery works is anybody who drives by the speeding camera at or below the speed limit is entered into a lottery to win the proceeds of the people who speed. Right? Right? Such a brilliant small change in the design. Big, negative, angry punishment or little tiny positive reinforcement for complying with the rules every day. The punishment is still there. Nothing's changed about the punishment, but little positive reinforcement. Guess which one works better? 20% reduction in speeding in Sweden from this technique. 20%. Nobody has ever been able to get speeding to drop by 20%, and everything has been tried. An astonishing, astonishing achievement by any measure. Sweden is rolling this out across the country as a result. Of course, many of you are familiar with Foursquare. It is often the barometer for the concept of gamification and highlights uh, how important mobile is to the concept of gamification. They really have grown together in tandem by empowering people to be able to do all kinds of things. And you'll see most of the examples I'm gonna to use today happen outside um, using either the mobile device or mobile in the broader sense where you're, where you're on the move, like Speed Camera Lottery. Um, but so of course, you know, Foursquare, what's really interesting about Foursquare is that uh, despite being the first successful mobile location-based social network, um, and in fact, Kevin earlier kind of uh, touched on it, which I, I was giggling about, um, Dennis and Avin, who founded the company, uh, you know, they used to have a mobile location-based social network called Dodgeball, which did not succeed and was bought by Google as a talent acquisition and promptly shut down by Google. And when their lockup ended, Dennis and Naveen relaunched their company, Dodgeball, on the iPhone with game mechanics. After 25 or more companies had attempted to build mobile location-based social networks and failed, what did Dennis and Naveen understand about mobile location-based social networking that nobody had understood before. <gasps> really simple. The process in the original mobile location-based social networking concept, it was all about finding your friends nearby. This is what Kevin said. I wanna find out where my friends are nearby. So I'm gonna check in to let them know. But that doesn't work. And it doesn't work for two important reasons. The first one is only a very narrow slice of the population cares about a problem like that. Anybody under 20 knows where their friends are all the time. And anybody over 40 doesn't care where their friends are. So this, this idea of where are my friends, I can find out, is really only about urban dwellers between the ages of 20 and 40. It's already a pretty small market. And number two, it takes nine steps to turn a mobile location-based social networking check-in into a cup of coffee or tea with a friend. Nine steps. It's not, I check in and magically I'm having coffee with my friend who's around the corner. It takes nine steps. Think about it. I check in here at the Shark Hotel. Now, somebody needs to, one of my friends needs to be nearby. That's step number one. Step number two, they need to be read, watching my social media traffic so they see my check-in in time while I'm still here. They need to have the time to meet me. They need to respond to my thing in time. I need to see their response while I'm still here, right? Think about this. Now, I've set up an, already it's an impossible task. We need to negotiate where we're going, choose a place to, to, to meet, and actually have that cup of coffee. Wow. When was the last time you did nine steps on any discrete activity? Nine steps in a discrete activity. When was the last time? Anyone? No. Because we never do that because nine steps is impossible because nobody does something that complex. Certainly not an optional activity. So what happened with all of the mobile location-based social networks? What happened? You checked into an empty room. You said, I'm here, and nobody responded. Or you said, I'm here, and once in a while someone would say three days later, oh my god, that's so cool, I was near next door, right? That doesn't give you positive reinforcement. So Dennis and Naveen reimagined it, and they made the multiplayer game, mobile location-based social networking, into the single player game, mobile location-based social networking, where you check in whether or not anybody is nearby you. 
You check in to earn badges and become the mayor of a place. And it doesn't matter if no one else is here. It doesn't matter if your friends were here four days ago. The game is not necessarily, the gamification is not necessarily always about the core activity. Sometimes it's about something around the core activity that gets people to behave a certain way. Another super cool example of gamification on mobile comes from um, reimagining work, right? Most people's jobs, that, you know, I don't know if you guys work in big companies or not, but most people's jobs don't have a lot of positive feedback in them. So the process, uh, you know, I, I used to work in a corporate job and uh, the way that we received a review was once a year, my manager would begrudgingly uh, come down from his office and say, okay, I have to give you your review. So you've been really good, uh -huh. here's your official uh, raise. Uh -huh. And then disappear for a year, so we didn't have to do that again. And so these companies, Ripple, so a couple of examples, Ripple and Duprops, are reimagining that whole idea to make the workplace a more positive and constructive environment. So the way that they work, it's very simple. Thank you so much for helping me out with the reports this weekend, this week. I send you on my mobile phone a little virtual item thanking you for doing that. Thanks for grabbing the coffee, right? It records our actions. It sends you virtual goods, karma, excitement, right? Positive reinforcement for your activity. It makes feedback a 360 degree instantaneous activity between subordinates and superiors, between peers, across an organization, transforming the landscape of feedback, transforming it inside companies completely. Major companies like Facebook have standardized on concepts like Ripple. Ripple was just purchased by Salesforce um, a few weeks ago. This concept of changing feedback using mobile to make it instantaneous inside organizations, really compelling. Another example uh, comes from the automotive business. So um, if you buy a hybrid or battery electric vehicle, it has become standard that your car will have a game in the dashboard, which has happened kind of spontaneously in the industry over the last few years. It started with the Toyota Prius, which put a little feedback flower in the car that showed you how you were performing and had all these stats, if you've ever owned a Prius, that showed you how your uh, fuel economy was over time and has advanced to the point where Nissan's Leaf, which is a battery electric car, today has a Facebook connected social game in the dashboard that allows you to compare your eco driving with your friends, so you can see how ecologically you drive. Or the Ford Fusion and Focus um, hybrid vehicle, which has this little green plant in the dashboard on the side that you guys can see I'm highlighting. And the way that that works is as you drive more ecologically, the plant grows lush and rich and thick. And as you don't, it withers and dies. It is an example of what we call a Tamagotchi or virtual pet game, where you need to constantly feed a virtual pet in order for it to be, uh, to be sustainable. So, so tell me this, everyone. This is $150 million worth of engineering on the, on the board right in front of you right now, seriously. It costs a lot of money to put games into the dashboards of cars and make them work in real time. And it's a product designed for people who've already purchased the item. Because by the time you get this thing, you just bought a car. And you're probably not gonna buy another car for another five to seven years. Why spend all this money, time, and effort to build something like this for people who've already bought your product and are not gonna buy it again for five to seven years? Well, there's a little bit of a social factor, right? The person sitting in the passenger seat can be excited about something to do in the car other than fight over the music. But also, it's to positively reinforce the reason why you bought the car in the first place every single day. Because otherwise, how does your car tell you that you're such a good person for buying that hybrid? How do you know? You spent all this extra money to buy this hybrid or battery electric car. How do you know how well you're doing? How do you get that feedback that you need? This is how. And it's been incredibly compelling. Another example uh, from the US, a company called Zamzi, which I, I uh, advise and help design. Um, Zamzi is a little uh, mobile device that you clip to your uh, pocket. Kevin had his Fitbit. This one is targeted at young, younger children. And so this product is basically a socially connected game attached to a little device that helps children uh, become more active and move more. And they've had astonishing results. In the first version, first release of the product, they got low socioeconomic status children, so poorer children who don't generally exercise very much, to move the equivalent of an extra marathon every month 
just by playing this socially connected game. An extra marathon every month. An amazing, amazing accomplishment using mobile gamification. Introduce you to another guy uh, who has an interesting story to tell, a guy named Charlie Kim. And Charlie runs a company called Next Jump, uh, which is a very successful $100 million New York-based company that provides employee incentives. And Charlie is also really into fitness. He loves working out. And he believes that all of his employees should work out regularly. And there's good science to back up why you want your employees to work out. It turns out it helps the brain function and you're more, you're more uh, cognitively sharp uh, if you work out on a regular basis. So Charlie wanted all of his employees to work out. So he did what most companies do when they want that, which is he built a gym. He put a gym in each one of his offices and he said, here, here's a free gym. And he found that not very many people were working out, not as many people as he would have liked would have worked out. So he built a mobile application, simple little mobile application that allowed people to check in. And he said, you know what, I'm gonna put up a prize, $20,000 prize. The top five employees who work out the most every year will split this amazing $20,000 prize. And Charlie Kim got 12% of Next Jump employees to work out on a regular basis, which is an amazing stat. 12% is a lot, that's a lot of health. And he thought, I think we could do better. So he retooled the game, the contest, in two critical ways. The first one was he allowed people to play in teams instead of individually. So he said, okay, instead of counting your individual score, now we're gonna make teams by location, and those teams will compete to see who works out the most. Same prize, now split among more people, so expected value goes down, but anyway. Same prize, $20,000, now playing teams. And number two, he introduced a leaderboard so the teams could compare their scores against each other. Today, nearly 80% of Next Jump employees work out on a regular basis, 8-0. Uh -huh. I'm telling you, your gym doesn't have that many people working out on a regular basis. You've never been in an environment like that in your whole life. Like every time you go for a meeting at Next Jump, it's like, hi, welcome to Next Jump. I'm really excited you're here because everyone's been like working out like all day. Um, it can be a little stressful, a little bit stressful to be there, but it's fun, uh, it's fun to see it. So they've had an extraordinary accomplishment by using some gamification techniques, including teams and leaderboards. And it turns out that team play is really powerful for engendering you know, amazing changes in behavior. Share with you a couple more sort of fun examples. Here's a guy named Ananth Pai. He's a teacher. Uh, in a class in, uh, outside of Minneapolis, uh, in Minnesota, in the US. And so Mr. Pai uh, be, was a business executive who decided to become a teacher, a middle school teacher, or elementary school teacher. And um, so the school board, the school district gave him a failing class to teach, a third grade class that was performing below their level. And he said, okay, I know you want me to fail, <laughs> but I'm gonna take this challenge from you if you let me redo the curriculum and do my, the curriculum my way. And they said, sure, your, your students are already failing, so what harm can you do? Redo the curriculum. So Mr. Pai went out and redid the math and reading curriculum for his third grade students to be entirely based on games. So he replaced the books with video games, many of which are played on the Nintendo DS, right? including games like Brain Age. And he supplements it with lots of real hands-on teaching. So he's constantly working with the students, but instead of reading textbooks, they're playing games. In the space of 18 weeks, Mr. Pai's failing third grade class went from below third grade level reading and math scores to mid fourth grade level in reading and math in 18 weeks, two years in a row. 18 weeks, one whole grade plus, amazing, right? And when you talk to the students about what they like about Mr. Pai's class, you say, what do you think of Mr. Pai's class? The thing they say over and over and over again is Mr. Pai's class is fun and Mr. Pai's class is social, right? It's no surprise that making something fun with feedback with friends will work well. And the Nintendo DS is an interesting if powerful tool for that. One last example for you. Uh, you guys all familiar with the hip-hop artist Jay-Z? So last year, Jay-Z put out an autobiography. Uh, and the book was called Decoded. And 
let's say many of Jay-Z's friends are not, many of Jay-Z's fans are not necessarily the world's biggest readers. So there was some concern about whether or not this biography of Jay-Z would be a popular book. So he decided that what they should do is they should make a game out of the book. And so a very, very inventive idea with the, with the group called Area Code. They went out and built this game for Decoded, and it was so cool. Every single page from the book was hidden somewhere in New York City based on whatever Jay-Z was talking about on that particular page. So for example, if he was talking about his favorite pizza restaurant in Brooklyn, where he grew up, at that pizza restaurant, they printed 50 boxes with that page from the book inside the cover. So that was spread out all over New York, 300 spreads. And the contest was the first person to capture all 300 images hidden around New York City, photograph them, and upload them to, the, to a site powered by Bing, won an amazing prize, which is two tickets for life to any Jay-Z concert for the rest of your life. Cool, right? Amazing. Amazing prize, if you like Jay-Z. If you don't like him, not such a good prize. But if you like him, it's great. And the cool thing about that prize, of course, is that that really doesn't have anything to do, any cost to Jay-Z, because he gets 100 free tickets at every concert. But to the average person, it seems like an amazing prize. It's really interesting, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. So it took 30 days for somebody to get all 300 spreads up online and win the prize. And what was really hilarious about it was the winner had actually hired people to help her find all of the locations. She went on a site called Craigslist, uh, which we have in the USA classified site, and she said, I need help, I'll pay you $10 an hour. <laughs> Your job is to find all this stuff. It was worth it, um, and she won the prize. So you can imagine being able to do this concept kind of for any context. If you can do it for a book, uh, I assure you, you can do it for just about anything. So at the heart of why, um, you know, many, at the heart of why uh, this worked uh, for Decoded is an important insight about how to make gamification work for your business and uh, your projects or whatever it is that you do. And this model that I put up on the board is called SAPS. And this is a list of the rewards that your customers want from you. The list of the rewards that consumers want. Status, access, power, and stuff. In order of stickiest to least sticky and also cheapest to most expensive. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Like, I'm a marketer. I, I was trained in marketing. That's what I did, you know, for my MBA. I was trained in marketing. And I was taught that what consumers want is they want free stuff. They want discounts, right? Isn't that what you want? A great deal? Isn't a deal what you want? Don't deals drive the world? Doesn't money move everything in society? Isn't that what the entire planet is based on, is trying to get more stuff? Isn't it? I don't think so. And I think the evidence is all around you. Status, access, and power, which are the main things that games trade in, because when was the last time your Xbox gave you $5 for successfully beating a game? Status, access, and power are significantly more powerful, emotional, and effective at creating long-term engagement and behavior change with consumers than stuff. Because what happens when you start giving people free things for their actions? Eventually, they just price it in. Oh, it's expected, of course. I get a mile for every dollar I spend. That's not exciting. That's just what I get. And then they start demanding it. And then they start expecting more of it. And the next thing you know, you're on a race to the bottom with all of your competitors to give away as much as possible to consumers. But status, access, and power, well, they scale much better. I'll give you an example, thought process. And I, do, I give this example everywhere. Um, it's kind of funny, but. So I will offer you, as a reward for your compliance in today's amazing lecture that your children will never sit through, uh, two possible rewards. The first one is a free cup of coffee at the cafe of your choice, at the lovely cafe around the corner here in the hotel. Or I'll give you a magic superpower. And your magic superpower is 
whenever you even so much as think about wanting a cup of coffee and you go near a cafe, the barista inside the cafe will immediately make your coffee exactly the way that you want it, exactly the way you want it. And it will be ready and hot and fresh for you on the counter the minute you walk in. It doesn't matter how many people are in line. It doesn't matter what time of day or night it is. It doesn't matter where you are, right? The transit lounge at Dubai, it doesn't matter. Your coffee is ready and waiting for you, hot and fresh. You bypass all the other people in the line. You walk right up to the counter. You pick up that cup of coffee. You look at everybody, laugh a little bit, and walk out of the store. But you have to pay for the coffee. Which one do you choose? Which one? Now, I ask this question all over the world. People who live in New York where, you know, the stereotype is that we're very tense all the time and like rushing everywhere. And places like Portland where everybody's high all the time and like <laughs> not really in a rush to do anything. <clears throat> and the answer is always the same. And this is because in our, because in your mind, and maybe many of you were thinking about this when I said the example, you thought, yeah, you know what? I really want that superpower because I'm busy. I'm a busy person. I have things to do. My time is really valuable. If I didn't have to wait in line for that coffee, I'd think of all the things that I could do. My time is valuable. Now, if you're an economist, you will know that the right answer to that question is A. It's always A. Because in A, where I give you the free cup of coffee, I'm saving you $3, which is money you would have spent anyway. And in B, you're still paying for the coffee. It's still costing you the $3. That time you're saving isn't worth $3. Because no matter how much money you make, you can't take that time and actually monetize it. Because it only comes in small intervals throughout the week. You can't aggregate that time and do something meaningful. The only thing you'll do with that time is send out a tweet. And I guarantee that that's not worth $3. The right economic decision is A, but we never choose that one. Huh, why is that? Why don't we ever choose, why don't we often choose the rational economic decision? Because people are not rational. <clears throat> and there's increasing science to back up this idea that we make decisions emotionally. We make decisions instantaneously. If you've read the books Blink or Nudge, you will have seen some of that work. We are programmed to instantly decide, I like that guy or I don't like that guy. I like that thing or I don't like that thing. That looks good to me. Oh, that looks terrible. Instant decisions. And then we backfill that with our rational minds. So we make the decision fast and then we rationalize it. The beauty of games and gamification are that they speak directly to our emotional core. They act on our brains in their, the most basic and powerful and meaningful of ways. They cause us to be inspired and to try to do things that are more meaningful and directional. When we bring feedback, friends, and fun, when we understand people and create an environment that allows them to experiment and multitask and see the world in a new way and rethink their engagement, we can produce amazing, amazing, amazing things. So uh, with whatever time it is that we have left for questions, I do want to say that if we don't get a chance to talk, I'll, I'll be around uh, for the next couple of days so we can chat. But this is my Twitter handle, at Jizakurum. And I love for you to ask me crazy questions on Twitter or in person. I love it. Like, I love questions like, Gabe, well, this is all fun, but how do we gamify something serious like cancer? I love stuff like that. So if you want to talk about how to gamify anything at all, you can reach me on Twitter or, uh, or ask me. A